And this video was sponsored by Surfshark VPN. August 15, 1939, a group of German Junkers 87 from the 76th dive bomber wing were approaching the military training area at Neuhammer. That day, the planes carried practice bombs with smoke charges that they were going to drop on the training targets. The bombing run was supposed to be nothing more than just a spectacular demonstration to impress the high-ranking Luftwaffe officers, who impatiently waited on the ground to finally see the JUD-7 in action. The group commander, Hauptmann Walter Siegel, checked his map once again to make sure they reached the training area then ordered his group to follow him and turned his plane into a steep dive. But in less than a minute, the demonstration, which was supposed to showcase the unique capabilities of the new German bomber, turned into a huge disaster, becoming the largest one-time loss of Ju-87 in its entire history. When it comes to the military aviation of World War II, it is hard to find an aircraft that was so controversial yet famous at the same time as the German Junkers 87. The deadly terrifying effectiveness of this bomber, demonstrated during the German offensive in Poland, France and Russia, quickly turned this aircraft into a true war legend, making the Ju-87 one of the most recognizable symbols of the German Blitzkrieg. But what is interesting is that the Ju-87, being feared and hated by its enemies for its amazing combat performance, was in the German Luftwaffe for quite a long time was the subject of intense debates and controversies. At the time, Junkers 87 represented a new class of bombardment aviation, the dive bombers the future of which in the 1930s was still uncertain. It was in particular because of this uncertainty that the Luftwaffe commanding officers gathered at the Neuhammer training field on August 15, 1939, just two weeks before the outbreak of World War II. The generals were to watch a demonstration of the ability of Junkers aircraft to drop bombs with unmatched precision due to a new technique called dive bombing. But to better understand the reasons for the German commander's doubts regarding the Junkers 87, let's do a quick dive into the history of this matter first. Although during World War I all the belligerent countries had eventually created their own heavy bomber units due to poor bombing accuracy, the actions of the heavy bombers inflicted more of morale damage to the enemy. But to be fair, it wasn't given that much importance at the time. The Italian military theorist Giulio Duet, in his famous work The Command of the Air, which later had a huge influence on the post-war development of aviation, wrote, IRL bombardment can certainly never hope to attain the accuracy of artillery fire, but this is an unimportant point because such accuracy is unnecessary. It was only later, after the end of World War I, that the accuracy of bombing began to be taken more seriously. One of the first who started working on this problem were the United States, whose geopolitical position dictated the need to combat large water surface targets when protecting their coastline. And although the efficacy of their test in the 1920s on sinking these ships with aerial bombs remains in debate to this date, it has nevertheless forced the US Navy to look more closely at the potential capabilities of naval aviation and created the need for searching for special bombing techniques to destroy small and maneuvering targets, such as ships for example. One of such techniques was dive bombing. The thing is that the bomb dropped from an aeroplane flying horizontally at high altitude is affected by multiple forces during its fall, which are sometimes simply impossible to calculate. Therefore, at best, the accuracy of the bombing at the time ranged in hundreds of meters, if not worse. The dive bombing was different. Unlike the aircraft dropping bombs while flying high and horizontally, the dive bomber would approach the target in a steep dive and release the bomb at low altitude. As a result, the bomb, after being released, would continue to fall along a given trajectory of the dive and would hit the target with unmatched precision, measured by dozens of meters instead of hundreds. This bombing technique was quite complex to execute and has its troubles, but the Americans nevertheless, in one form or another, continued their bombing experiments. Watching the dive bombers in action was a breathtaking view, so it even became the element of some aerobatic shows at the time. And it was one such dive bombing demonstration that was accidentally witnessed by a German pilot, whose name is now inextricably linked with the creation of the dive bomber's most famous representative, Junkers 87. But here I'd like to stop for a moment and mention yet another famous representative but in the class of VPNs, the Surfshark VPN, who kindly sponsored this video. Surfshark is a virtual private network that keeps you and your data safe by encrypting all of the information sent between your device and the internet so no big companies or hackers can get your personal information or invade your privacy. Since Surfshark does this by changing your location and IP address, that means you can also bypass the geo-blocking, allowing you to access the content and streaming services from 
other countries. I like watching various documentaries and there is nothing worse for me than seeing the message that the content is not available in my region. It happened to me recently with Tomcat Tales, which is not available for me to watch since I'm in Canada. But in just a couple of clicks I was able to change my location to the United States and spend the evening enjoying the documentary featuring one of my most favorite fighter aircraft. The best thing is that Surfshark VPN supports content like mine and gives the viewers of Paper Skies 83% off and 3 extra months free when using the link below and the promo code Paper Skies. That is a ridiculous discount. You can use one account on an unlimited number of devices and there is also a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is no risk involved in trying it out. Thanks again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video and let's get back to the Junkers 87 story. In 1933, Germany adopted the so-called Urgent Program of Aviation Development, which in particular included the development of a new dive bomber. It is worth saying that from a technological standpoint, the development of a dive bomber was a much more difficult task than it might seem. To achieve the needed accuracy of bombing, such a bomber would dive to the ground at an angle close to 80 degrees, which in turn required the solution of many technological problems. For instance, the bomb drop from a standard holder during the steep dive would go through the propeller area, completely destroying it. So one of the first tasks was the development of a special bomb holder, the so-called swing bomb rack. Also, the aircraft must be able to dive at slower speeds and exit the dive at low altitude, which would require complex wing mechanization. In addition to this, when pulling out of the dive, the aircraft incurs a force close to 5G, which means the bomber had to be durable and robust. Thus, the required aircraft would have to be close to fighters in its agility and durability and close to a medium bomber payload-wise. But the main problem was the controversial concept of a dive bomber itself, which was in the Luftwaffe had its supporters and opponents as well. In 1935, the idea of dive bombers received a strong proponent represented by the newly appointed inspector of fighters and dive bombers, Colonel Ernst Udet, not long ago a national hero of the German Empire for being the second best fighter ace after the all-famous Red Baron Manfred Richthofen. It is believed that while in the United States, Ernst Udet was amazed by the air performance of the Curtis Hawks, which in particular demonstrated the dive bombing technique. Udet was delighted with the American plane and even purchased two of them, which were then delivered to Germany. He also shared with Hermann Goering, the newly appointed Minister of Aviation, he thought that if you release bombs at the altitude of half as much as the Americans do, you could hit targets more precisely. But the dive bomber concept also had powerful opponents, and one of the main was the Luftwaffe's chief of the technical office, Wolfram Richthofen, the cousin of the famous Red Baron, who strongly believed that the idea of dive bombing was absurd. In his opinion, this low flying bomber, while attacking the target at low altitudes, would be an easy target for enemy anti aircraft guns and fighters, leaving the bombers little chance to hit the target and survive. Moreover, Richthofen, being a pilot himself in the past, was perfectly aware of the G force level the pilot would experience when exit in the dive, hence he feared that the high-level skills required for dive bombing could not be expected of average pilots in the Luftwaffe. It's worth mentioning that the history of the trials and adoption of the Junkers 87 dive bomber into service was full of intrigues and definitely deserves its own video, meanwhile we will jump straight ahead to the final stage of the German dive bomber competition. On June 9, 1936, Wolfram Richthofen issued a recommendation to cancel all further JUG-7 development because he considered the aircraft to be worthless. But the very next day, on June 10, Richthofen was removed from his position and the new chief of technical office became Ernst Udet, who immediately rejected Richthofen's order regarding the Junkers 87. Ernst Udet's appointment accelerated the development of a new German dive bomber and eventually led to the adoption of the Junkers Ju-87, which Udet was believed to have failed from the very beginning of the competition. Ironically, Wolfram Ryugoffen's new assignment was to take a field command in the Condor Legion, a Luftwaffe unit sent to support nationalists in the Spanish Civil War. And it was to the Condor Legion that the very first models of the Ju-87 were soon sent to test their capabilities in real combat conditions. To be fair, Ryugoffen, while in Spain, should be given credit for thinking outside the box. At first, his initiatives found little understanding in the minds of Luftwaffe's high command, who were hypnotized by Due's doctrine and believed that all bombers should operate primarily far beyond the front line. 
On the contrary, Goffin most often used his Ju-87 closer to the front line as a direct support for ground forces, where the Ju-87's incredible bombing accuracy became extremely useful. The aircraft's ability to hit small targets even earned the new bomber the nickname Flying Artillery. And one might say that the German offensive in Europe in the initial period of World War II might have developed quite differently if the Junkers 87 opponents, who tried every opportunity to cancel the plane, had succeeded in their efforts. And it was just two weeks before the outbreak of the war when one tragic accident seemed to create yet another doubt regarding the capabilities of the Ju-87 dive bomber. In August 1939, Germany was on the final stretch in its preparation for the war. As a part of the process, the Germans decided to hold a demonstration exercise for the Luftwaffe, the conclusion of which would be a spectacular attack performed by dive bombers. The Ju-87 from Sturzkampgeschwader 76 were to hit the training targets at Neuhammer training area in front of the Luftwaffe commanding officers. By the way, Wolfram Rigoffen was also among those officers on the ground. The demonstration of the dive bomber's impressive capabilities was supposed to instill confidence in the hearts of the generals regarding the latest dive bomber that was to provide support to German troops in the war soon to come. The choice of the flight unit for the demonstration was not accidental. The Sturzkampfgeschwader 76 was the first Luftwaffe unit that received new dive bombers. According to the task, the first group of the unit was to take off from the Cottbus airfield, fly to Neuheimer training area and drop their bombs on the given targets right in front of General's gates. On any other day, such a task would hardly have caused any difficulties for Group Commander Hauptmann Ziegel, but on that day, right before the takeoff, he was informed that there was a cloudness right over the training area, with the upper edge at an altitude of 2000 meters and the lower one at 900. Normally, the minimum safe altitude for the Ju-87 to pull out of the dive was around 500 meters, so the commanders thought that having the cloudness over the field was even better. Unsuspecting generals would look up at the sky, from which, all of a sudden, the German bombers would swiftly fall out, magnificently hitting the targets with their bombs, and then swiftly disappearing into the clouds. Isn't that a great-looking show you wouldn't forget? Hauptmann Walter Ziegel personally led his unit in that flight. To his left and right were the bombers piloted by his adjutant and group's chief tech officer, while behind him, in close formation, flew all three squadrons of his group. As in all previous training flights, after having reached the destination point, the commander put his Ju-87 into a deep dive, quickly disappearing in the cloud. The rest of the unit, one after the other, followed the commander roaring through the clouds. Later, Walter Ziegel recalled that he sensed something was wrong when the clouds did not end for quite a long time, and then the whiteness in front of him, instead of dissipating, all of a sudden began to darken. As a highly experienced pilot, he immediately understood that he was seeing the ground, and Ziegel pulled the stick abruptly, trying to get his plane out of a fatal dive. At the same time, he screamed into his radio to his wingman, abort, pull up, pull up. According to eyewitnesses, Ziegel managed to pull his Ju-87 out of the dive, right over the ground, flying at barely 1 or 2 meters high. Meanwhile, the pilots following him did not have enough time to react to his command. First, both Ziegel Winkmans crashed into the ground almost vertically, followed then by all nine Ju-87 from the second squadron. The pilots of the third squadron were a bit more fortunate. Only two planes crashed into the forest trees, meanwhile the rest of the squadron managed to pull their planes out of the dive just above the ground. The first squadron, which flew the last in the order, had heard Ziegel's command and had enough time to seize the dive. Meanwhile, on the ground, it was hard to describe the experience of the German generals, who witnessed the reigning Junkers. The stricken spectators silently watched certain fires and black puffs of smoke over the forest. The show indeed became an unforgettable one. An investigation of the accident conducted on the same day found that the cause of the disaster was a sudden heavy fog, which arose just about an hour before the appearance of Ziegel's group over the training field. Touching the lower part of the clouds, the fog actually lowered the bottom edge of the cover to a bare 100 meters. The personnel on the training field did not have direct communication with the airbase, so there was no way for them to report the sudden changes in weather conditions. According to the results of the investigation, the commander of the group, Hauptmann Ziegel, was officially found not guilty of the tragedy. Unfortunately for other European countries, the disaster that occurred did not crack the Luftwaffe's confidence in Junkers 87, and soon the bomber would make its bloody contribution into the horrors of World War II, taking part in the German campaigns in Poland, Norway, France and the USSR. 
But to be fair, starting with the Battle of Britain, it became clear that high performance of the Ju-87 was only possible when total superiority in the sky is provided. Otherwise, the Ju-87 bombers encountering enemy fighters suffered significant losses. But even in this case, during the whole period of war, there was just a few days when Ju-87 encountered the loss of 15 or more planes in a single day. And even in those cases, the losses of the bombers were spread out in hours throughout the day. Meanwhile, on August 15, 15, 1939, without encountering enemy forces, the Luftwaffe lost 13 Ju-87s and 26 pilots in less than one minute, making the accident at Neuheimer the worst one-time loss in the entire Ju-87 history. Another interesting detail about the accident is that the leader of the first squadron was Dietrich Belt, who would soon become the youngest general of the Wehrmacht and one of the German bombardment aviation commanders, whose task during the war in particular was overseeing the strategic development of the German bomber arm. And who knows how the history of the Luftwaffe would have turned out if on August 15, 1939, Dietrich would have been among the first pilots to follow Siegel's dive into the fog. As for Siegel himself, despite feeling guilty for the tragedy, it did not stop him from successfully fighting during World War II. As the commander of his quickly reinforced group, Walter Siegel was among the very first pilots to drop the bombs on Poland on September 1, 1939. He later took part in the French campaign, then in the Battle of Britain, he flew over Greece and Crete and fought in North Africa as well until his appointment as a commander of German Air Force in Norway. On May 8, 1944, Walter Ziegel went on an inspection flight to check the camouflage of the battleship Tirpitz in the Trondheim fjord. Right after the take of a thick fog suddenly appeared, as a result of which Ziegel's aircraft accidentally caught the power line wires and the plane crashed. Walter Ziegel was killed in the accident. The deadly fog, which he miraculously escaped in 1939 at the Neuhammer, eventually overtook him too. And that's the story! If you like aviation and stories like this, hit the like button to support new episodes on this channel, don't forget to check the link from Surfshark VPN in the description, special thank you to all who support Paper Skies on Patreon, that's all for now, thanks for watching and see you in the next video, goodbye!